Max Münke. I'm a physician, scientist at the National Human Genome Research Institute. I'm the chief of the medical genetics branch, which is one of nine intramural branches of NHGRI. And I'm the director of the NIH Medical Genetics and Genomic Medicine Residency and Fellowship Programs. I was born in Germany, in northwestern Germany, in Westphalia, very small town with a long history and grew up there until I was five. Then we moved from Westphalia to further north, uh, almost at the Northern Sea, almost at the uh, Netherlands border. And that's where I lived from the time I was five until I was six. And then we moved back to the same place. So my father was a lock keeper. So we always lived near a lock. And the lock was always outside of town. So if the town had 500 people where I grew up, then around the lock there were maybe 10 people, maybe two families or three families. My mother was a homemaker. She would make dresses for everyone in town. And she was also the town psychologist. Every woman in town would come to her and would share her problems with my mom. So. I know my mother, I know my grandmother on my father's side and my grandfather on my mother's side. My father grew up in Pomerania, which is now after World War II Poland. And he was a Lutheran. And then he grew up in a small, uh, in a small family where there were many babies born, but they all died. And in the end, there were four children who grew up and my grandfather was blind. He first worked as a forest worker in some Duke's forest. And then by the time he was blind, he would raise bees. He could do that while he was blind. And he died on the track from after, he, he starved on the track from uh, Eastern Germany to Berlin at the time, at the end of World War II. And my grandmother made it with her youngest son, and my father by that time was a soldier in the war and had corresponded with my mother. That was what young girls were supposed to do then, write to soldiers at the front. And so after the war was over and he was released from being a prisoner of war in an American camp, he was released and he gave the address not as Pomerania, but he gave my mom's address. When he showed up, he they were all very startled that someone would really have used the address and show up. So. And then they started dating and it became clear a Lutheran cannot marry a Catholic. So my dad became a Catholic and they got married. Ten months later, my sister was there and five years later, I was there. So I think it really planted the seed for appreciation of nature so that I always had my small garden that I always had to, that or the other way around, that there were not always playmates there. I had to do things by myself. And garden was one of them. Getting piano lessons was another one of them. But this was at a time where there was no karate, soccer clubs or any of that. You just had to entertain yourself. So, and I, I certainly enjoyed, I, I certainly enjoyed the, the various things that I could do from planting plants underground and being surprised that once I dug them back up again, that they had lost their green, that they were just white, and that they had lost the chlorophyll. It was just fun to see. Uh, it was a small school. It was, we were at least with one other grade. So it was first grade and second grade. And I think temporarily we were four grades, first to fourth grade in one in one grade. We had um, children who had various intellectual and physical disabilities in the same grade. It became very clear that at age six, when I could read and write, that I was supposed to and enjoyed teaching someone who was nine years old, who was physically impaired. And what, what I thought was already as a, as a six or eight year old, I thought was striking. We had many, many children who were what you call now intellectually impaired. At the time, the language not, was not politically correct at all. 
And they all worked on a farm and it all worked out fine. There was no special ed there. And what parents made sure is they felt whether you're intellectually impaired or not, you need a mate. And at 16, they found someone who usually was also intellectually impaired and they had many children afterwards. And as, a, as an eight-year-old, I thought, I wonder what those children would be like. So, and, and that probably contributed more to my choice of career than any of my nature experiments beforehand. So um, in Germany at the time, that was in the, uh, the mid-60s, you would go either to one school for nine years, so that was from first to ninth grade, or you would be for four years in that school, and then in fifth grade you would go to gymnasium. And that was for the ones who were better than the others, I say that in quotes, and out of my grade, out of, I forget, 30 or so kids, there was one that went to gymnasium, and that was me. And so going to gymnasium for four weeks, it turned out that within four weeks, I developed something that most likely was polio. And that, despite the fact I was polio vaccinated, was in a very small children's ward on a, in, in a hospital in a nearby town. And uh, it was striking to me that as a, again, as a 10 year old or as an 11 year old, I could see they did not know what I was having. And I was struck by that. I thought, how come you don't know what I'm having? And so I got physical therapy. I got massages. I got water baths, all of the things that I liked, but not, nothing of the Western medicine that we talk about now. So. I, I think it had a number of effects since I couldn't turn the page on a book. I had to ask the other boys. I was in a what was called the big boys room. So there were eight of us there and the big boys room was kids anywhere between 10 and 16 or so. And so I was one of them. So I had to ask them to turn the pages. Someone would come to feed me. And I still remember it was striking that if I didn't get the person's attention, the fork would go into the cheek or the soup would go down my pajamas. And so I knew from the very beginning to look the person in the eye and, and talk to her. And once I had her attention, I would get the food exactly where it had to go. So it was very, it was quite intriguing, I have to tell you. And so that I was in that hospital for about nine months. And then they said, Max is cured except for after nine months when I couldn't walk, my parents didn't think I was cured. And then I, uh, our family physician made sure that I went to a university clinic, which was in Münster in Westphalia. And that was quite, that was about a hundred, almost a hundred miles away from where my parents lived. And I was in there then for another eight weeks, they diagnosed what it was. There was more physical therapy, and then they sent me back home. And from then on, things started to get better. And what was very clear, something had changed then. I had learned that communication is the most important thing. If you cannot communicate with the other person that you want to talk to, it doesn't help. And that's good for languages. It's good for your own language, for different dialects. It, it means being present with a person. So that, that gave quite an impact. And then the other impact that it had is that even being born in a family where my father would have been proud if I would have become a lockkeeper, becoming a physician was something highly unusual. In my family, I was the only one who went to college and, and then to medical school. So. In, in Germany, both uh, medical school encompasses college and medical school all in one. So you do everything together. You do gymnasium and that goes to 13th grade. For me, I was then a year older since I, I, I stopped a year and then went back. And I think on a, on a somewhat personal note that had to do with my upbringing, when I came back, as my sister says, I was spoiled rotten. I could my, ask my parents for any favors and I would get them. And so once I came back out of the hospital, I had a dog, I had birds, I had pigeons, I had gerbils, I had golden hamsters, I had mice. I would go along with a dog who would have a pigeon on his back and we would go for walks. 
was a little circus scene. But then what I also did do is I, I was just delighted that I was able to breed mice. And to my surprise, every once in a while, out of two gray mice, they would have a white mouse as an offspring. And I, I was hoping I could breed white mice because I predicted that they would have white offspring. But I never made it to that stage. So, so that, was, that was part of the upbringing in, in nature. I, I think the part that I forgot is each year there was a lamb that I would get from the shepherd and I would raise the lamb through the, through the summer. So, and that was certainly felt very special. There are not that many, not, not that many kids who raise lambs while they're kids. So. <laughs> Probably would be also smiling of the image of a little Max watching TV with a lamb on the lap with the, with the feet and, 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 and watching for shows that the lamb liked the best. And for the, for the lamb like best, either Lassie or Fury, the, oh. the, Amer the American shows. So these were like way back when we're talking in the mid 60s. So mm -hmm. in, in Germany, there's one central system. Since in Germany, there are no private schools. Every school at the time were public schools. And they're plus minus all equally good. There is no, there's not the Harvards of the, of the medical schools. And there is not the, I don't want to put a name to a school that doesn't rank very, very high. In Germany, they're all in the middle to upper third, and uh, middle or upper uh, uh, two thirds, and, and so get a good education wherever you go. So I decided to go to Berlin, which was quite exciting, coming from a tiny place in northern Germany, going to the big city with over a million people. So there was a slight difficulty there. When I got admitted to medical school, I was a in Germany, it's, uh, there's a compuls there, at the time, there was a compulsory army for every young man had to join the army. And I was in the military. And of course, being a, an active soldier, you cannot, couldn't drive through former East Germany because it was a communist country at the time. And West Germany, where I come from, is a is part of NATO and all of that. So I had to fly from Hanover to, at the time, Berlin Tempelhof. And so then, I was in Berlin and was there for seven years and enjoyed it tremendously. And the fact of leaving the military to going to medical school, the discrepancy of drudgery to enjoyment couldn't have been, and the excitement couldn't have been further apart. It was exciting beyond belief, just exciting. To actually do what I thought were real sciences, to do chemistry, physics, organic chemistry. And it was just thrilling to do biology, to do medical genetics, which we had already as undergraduates. It was just thrilling, just thrilling. And to me, in Germany, there's something that's called Physikum. It's the first major exam that you take for, before you start your clinical, uh, your, your clinical training. And for me, as soon as I had the physicum, I could teach the medical genetics class. I could teach students who were just a year behind me. And that felt just wonderful. I enjoyed that a lot. One topic was very close to my heart because someone had put me on the right track. It wasn't even genetics, but it was a teratogen. And uh, I'm sure you have heard about thalidomide, and thalidomide was a medication that was generated by a German pharmaceutical company, and that was sold as a means that uh, was sold against morning sickness during pregnancy. And the connection between the thalidomide, or Contagan was the name in, in the, of the medicine in German, uh, and the limb anomalies both of the legs and the arms, where there were shortened limbs, almost flipper-like hands, depending upon when the medication was taken, was identified by a German pediatrician and physician and by an Australian obstetrician. And the German pediatrician was Professor Widukind Lenz, who at the time was in the children's, worked at the Children's Hospital in Hamburg in Germany. And he was an expert in limb anomalies and people from all over Europe would send him uh, their x-rays and he would consult and he would write them back. And to his surprise, for some time he would get one or two inquiries per year. Out of a sudden he would get two to three per week. And so eventually it turned out what they all had in common was 
that the, the moms had taken thalidomide and that happened in the late 50s and early 60s and he was the one to make that connection. And so I had listened to him in Germany as, as a high school student. There was something called Volkshochschule, which is sort of the high school for lay people. And I went there and so here was Professor Wiedemann was talking about this and I got so excited that I went to him afterwards and asked, how can I do something what you, like what you are doing? And he said, hmm, go to medical school, become a, pedi a pediatrician, go do basic research, do clinical training in genetics. And I followed his advice and here I'm sitting. So, And, and so I, I taught that. And so what I had is in, in my section on medical genetics, it was basic drawing pedigrees. It was basic chromosome analysis. It was taking a family history, it was taking a prenatal history, and then it was showing photos. It was showing photos of individuals who have Down syndrome, that is chromosome anomalies, who had very specific, who had very specific teratogenic anomalies, let's say fetal alcohol embryopathy, who had very typical syndromes. And I would talk about all of them as if I had seen them, as if I had known them, where I really had seen only photos and read lots of books about it. So, but my interest was really set then as like, this is just so exciting. So, yes. What was next was easy because in Germany, you do, even as a physician, you do a thesis. And I did the thesis work with the department chairman, Professor Karl Sperling at the Free University in Berlin in the human genetics department. And mine was on cell cycle regulation and different chromosome, what, what chromosomes look like. Obviously, we all know what metaphase or what mitotic chromosomes look like, but then looking throughout the cell cycle in G1, S phase and G2 phase. And I looked at nuclear law organizing uh, re regions that are on the acrocentric chromosomes, chromosome 13, 14, 15, 21, 22. And it was, it was interesting. And before I had finished medical school, I had an offer to continue my work there. And so then I had a contract as, uh, as to work at the institute for five years. And I left after nine months because I really wanted to work with patients and started then left Berlin after seven years and went to uh, the children's hospital at the University of Kiel in Schleswig-Holstein, which is almost, which is at the Baltic, is a Baltic harbor, almost maybe 40, 50 miles from the Danish border. And I did my pediatrics residency training there. And the chair of that department was another famous geneticist, Professor uh, Wiedemann. And Professor Wiedemann is, in the US, the syndrome is called uh, Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. In Europe, it's called Wiedemann-Beckwith syndrome. And it's a syndrome where we're, of course, now the underlying causes. And it was, it was very interesting to have him as a department chair, even though he was professor emeritus by the time he, he changed during, during my training. But he stayed there, and so I would see patients with him even after he was professor emeritus. So. So, oh, it cha challenged the sympathetic nervous system. It was being on a on an infant ward for, for uh, two months when I started in July was fantastic and learning all about middle ear infection, diarrhea, GI issues, all of that, that was wonderful. But after two months, I was on the, uh, on, on the NICU and the neonatal intensive care unit and that really got my blood and my adrenaline going and it was scary and I was there for I was there for six months, and after six months, I was happy to say that my sympathetic nervous system had calmed down quite a lot. I had learned a lot. And then from then on, I would be working. When I came in in the morning, before I saw patients, I would go to the cytogenetics lab, would do what we call cytogenetic rounds, would look at all of the cells, would look, look at all of the amniocytic flasks. So we did that for an hour. And then by 7.30 or 8 o'clock, I went to my ward and would see patients there. So, and that, that was then for the really for the first time where I would see children who had birth defects of various kinds. And many times, actually, more often than not, we did not know what the diagnosis was. So.
So this would have been in the early 80s. So. <laughs> A mere coincidence. Uh, I had met Dr. Franke at the human genetics meeting that at the time was in Essen. And Professor Passage, who was the organizer of that meeting, had this wonderful picnic. And I dared myself to talk to Dr. Franke at the time. And she is, of course, very easygoing. What made it particularly easygoing that she's German speaking. So I spoke with her and told her of my interest. And she said she would be happy to talk to me some more about it. Then I visited different places in the US. And Yale was one of them. And out of Minneapolis, Atlanta, Baltimore, Boston, I decided Yale and Uta Franke's lab was the best lab for me. So. She is significant for many reasons. On a personal level, she's just radiant. And she is her enthusiasm for work, for patients, for cytogenetics, for molecular genetics is just infectious. And then she is someone who has won numerous teaching awards. So she has been a mentor for me to be a good mentor. She has taught the human genetics class at Yale for years before she then went off to Stanford and taught genetics there. Taught, uh, was a medical director of the genetic counseling training program at Stanford. And I think her, she has numerous accomplishments. And some of them were that Jorge Yunus at, uh, at, at the time at the University of Minneapolis, and she simultaneously generated the, the high resolution chromosomes from chromosomes that were when they were G-banded in, let's say, mid-metaphase. They had maybe four, had a 400 band stage, and then the chromosomes that Uta Franke generated had anywhere between 800 and 1,000 bands. So in essence, it increased the resolution of getting first glimpses at the genome. And the talk that she gave in Essen at the human genetics meeting in Germany in, I guess it was 1980, was a talk how she had identified various deletions and duplications in patients and her ease of going back and forth between the laboratory and showing patients and the chromosomes and coming up with causes, defining minimal critical regions. I was in awe of that and I thought, oh, I want to do something like what she does. So. Mm -hmm. They can PubMed my name at the time since I was set, my wife and I were set to go back to Germany. My name was spelled at the time in the German way, that is M-U with the two dots, that is the umlaut N-K-E. So if you go to PubMed and you search for that, you'll find the 10 papers that came out of that time. Mm -hmm. And they were mostly mapping papers. And you find uh, chromosomes, DNA, and patients all in one paper. And to me, that was exactly what I wanted to get out of that time. And one, one collaboration was to work with uh, Leon Rosenberg, who was at the time the department chair, and Jan Kraus, who was a postdoc in the lab. He had identified the gene for homocystinuria, uh, CBS, or cyst cystathionine beta synthase. And I had the good fortune to map it to, a, to chromosome 21 and then to map it to a very specific region on chromosome 21. And that was. I happened to be at the right place at the right time, and it was fun. It was just very enjoyable. And I met Francis Collins here. I had, to my surprise, uh, I met all three first-year fellows there. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the three third-year fellows. One was named Jay Gargas, and he is now, I'm not sure, either in California or at the University West Virginia. Then there is, I'm blanking on his name, and then there was someone named Francis Collins. And out of the three of them, again, I was very impressed. I was allowed, even though I couldn't see patients, since I hadn't passed the, the US exams, medical exams, I would sit into, in, in the noon conference, and Francis Collins would talk about patients he had seen in the morning would give a presentation, an hour-long presentation, about a specific syndrome. And in the afternoon, he gave another 
hour-long presentation about chromatin remodeling or something that he did in Sherman Weissman's lab. And I was really the word awe is an understatement. So, and so we overlapped for a total of six months. I started in at Yale in January of 1982 and Francis finished his three-year training in clinical genetics as an internist uh, in June of 82 before he went on to University of Michigan to become an assistant professor there. So yes, I've known him. He was one other than Uta Frank, who was one of the first people I met there, actually. So it was yeah. very clear there was, a, there, was a, there was a hierarchy there. So there was Francis Collins. It became very clear very soon that he had published quite some solid papers with Sherman Weissman and had then continued to publish papers as an assistant professor, papers that are being cited now from uh, cystic fibrosis to uh, neurofibromatosis and, 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 and. So these were not disease, rare, rare disease genes, but he worked on common disease genes and was able to identify them. So it wasn't just the clarity of communicating a, a presentation. What he has is he had then and obviously has now has a gift of speaking to different uh, to people from different walks of life and to me that has been always important if you can speak to your peers that's that's okay that's a c plus but if you can talk to people from from to people who are non physicians who are non geneticists that's a b plus if you can talk to people who are have either who are either Nobel laureates or who are intellectually impaired, as in not in the same boat, but in the morning in the clinic, talk to people who have an impairment, and then talk to people who are on the very on a very different end. To me, that's a gift of communication. So that's that is to me the the A plus of communication of what Francis Collins has, and mm. and I admire that. So. Uta Franke being a good mentor. She had greased the wheels before I went the, for the interview. She had called two colleagues there at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I never had this feeling ever again that when I walked into the chairman's office, my very first interview, I knew I had already the job. And I could only imagine that was thank you to Uta. My CV didn't hurt either, but it was really the good mentor who had done that. So, And of course, the prerequisite for that was not only to be able to speak English, which I couldn't when I, when I came to Yale in 1980, 1982, but to also having passed, the, at the time it was called the ECFMG exams, and now they're called the USMLE exams, part one and two. I had passed those, I think, in the fall of, 2000, uh, of uh, 1985, and then I was admitted to be one of the first year clinical genetics trainees in uh, July of 1986. Uh, it was very different. It was, it was really one was working just in the lab and, and visiting the, the noon conference at Yale, but not being able to be with patients or to see patients. And here for the first time, it felt I was actually needed at Yale, whether I was there or not. It didn't quite matter, but there was enough drive and enough ambition that it mattered to me. At the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, if there was a consult at 3 a.m. in the morning, it was clear who had, a, who had to go there. If I was a fellow on call, I had to be there at 3 a.m. in the morning. And it felt really good to be so important that you would show up at 3 a.m. to see this patient in the morning in the NICU. So, and so what uh, in, in the training in Philadelphia, I think very highly of that training program. And that in the first year, all you do is you see patients, patients, and more patients. As in an outpatient setting, as inpatients on the consult service, in the biochemical, um, in the metabolism division, in the dysmorphology division, and so on. So, so it's a very solid foundation of what patients look like, and there I actually I got my very first taste for that patients are not all of Northern European descent of what I had, of course, was trained in, in Northern Germany. Everyone was fair-skinned, fair, fair hair, light hair, blue eyes, 
and out of a sudden at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, about half of half people there came were of Northern European descent, maybe a third of uh, other descent and, and probably one third were African Americans. And for me, this was a very new experience. I, I mean, there I, I learned at the same time, I learned dysmorphology from one of the masters, Dr. Elaine Zakai. I learned from her oh, this is a child with Down syndrome, and this is what a child with Down syndrome looks like from this ethnic background. And no, she did not have to teach me how a child with Down syndrome from Northern European background looks like, because I knew that. And, and so I, at the same time, I didn't learn just dysmorphology in children of, of Northern European descent. I had learned that with Professor Wiedemann in Kiel in Northern Germany, but with Dr. Zakai, it was the patient is there and what comes next and how, how, does a how does a patient most benefit from your coming into the patient's room, talking to the patient's mother, parents, sometimes grandparents. So, it was very variable, anywhere between one and 20 patients. So if we were in the craniofacial clinic, we would see 20 patients. There was a patient every 15 minutes because they came there. There's a multi in the, either the cleft clinic or the craniofacial clinic. There's a multidisciplinary approach from speech pathologists to feeding experts to occupational therapists, physical therapists, neurologists, ophthalmologists, geneticists. We're all a team, craniofacial surgeons. So you would see every patient just for a brief time, but over time you would meet them on a monthly basis. And so you would get to know them and you would see, oh, this is what this child looked like before surgery. And the surgery looks so amazing that you barely see the cleft of the lip afterwards, or the child's face has changed where the shape of the head was very misshapen at birth, that after surgery, there's a beautifully formed head there of the child with just a minor scar there. So, in Germany, people would always think of genetics only as an afterthought. And to me, it was thrilling how important medical genetics is in the US. So for example, when a child was born in the middle of the night, and this child had multiple anomalies, instead of having the surgery already scheduled for the morning, the first person other than the neonatologist, the obstetrician and the neonatologist who would see the baby was a geneticist. And so sometimes it was already based on the fact of looking at the multiple congenital anomalies in the newborn baby. There was a very high suspicion this baby may have trisomy 13. This baby may have trisomy 18. We then would at 3 a.m. or maybe by that time it was 4 a.m do a bone marrow aspiration, have the cytogeneticist come in, and then with the cytogeneticist confirmation, this is trisomy 18. We knew that by seven o'clock, and that had a decision where then the next larger conversation was with the parents. Do you want a surgery in your child whose prognosis with regards to longevity is very guarded? having, let's say, either trisomy 13 or trisomy 18. And just to see the value of genetics and the impact that genetics can have on decision-making on parents and on, the entire, and on the entire medical team, many times involving ethicists, I think is something that I, where, where I really learned, begin to appreciate even more, not just genetics as a little sideshow to medicine, but that it's really, this is one of the main players in pediatrics, and obviously it has changed now. It's a main player in every single specialty. So, yes, yeah, since, since anywhere between 2 and 4% children, newborns, have a birth defect, some are mild, some of them are severe, and parents want to know, what does it mean for the child? How will my child be doing? Can this be repaired? How, is my, how will my child be doing? Most important question is always, how is my child doing intellectually? Will my ch child develop normally? 
And sometimes there are answers, sometimes there are not clear answers, and the child is a guide. And then sometime later, not in those first conversations, at some point later, the, child, the parents want to know, is it genetics? Could this happen to us again? As in, what is the recurrence risk if we have another child? Mm -hmm. Probably the most important part is to go one step back and actually to just listen. And to, to even start out with very general question to see what's on their mind. And after you have done that a hundred times, after you have done that 500 times or a thousand times, there are themes there and themes of concern. Every parent expects a child that is born normal. And every parent expects a child that looks beautiful. And if you have a child with multiple congenital anomalies, that's the shock to parents. And to just be there and to just see when are parents ready to hear what. And I, 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 I think that I find very important, the communication with the parents to have a relationship with the parent with the parents that not only is good for that one hour of counseling, but that will allow parents to happily come back when they are ready for more questions. And whether they're happily coming back is in two weeks or in four weeks or in eight weeks, it doesn't matter. But it's something, I think this first year of life in a, when a child is born with severe congenital anomalies is very critical to form a bond, not to switch healthcare professionals with follow-up appointments, but we have the same healthcare providers there throughout that year, and ideally throughout, throughout all of childhood. So, mm. okay. yes. So I uh, part of the at the time the way the program at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia worked was the first year you see patients, if not twenty four seven, but all the time, and then in your second and third year you have your continuity clinic, you participate in conferences and the didactics that is being offered, you present patients, but then you work in a laboratory. And the laboratory that I chose at the time was a laboratory of Bob Nussbaum. And Bob Nussbaum at the time was a Howard Hughes investigator. And so I was in his lab, I had a position that was paid through Howard Hughes. And that was Wonderful on many levels, probably the most practical level. I think I got a 100% or a 200% raise in salary from being a clinical fellow to being a Howard Hughes fellow in Bob Nussbaum's lab. That was very wonderful, having three, being married and having three small children. So that, that certainly was wonderful, but I know you're asking about what did I do in his lab? <laughs> and at the time it was quite exciting that Bob had been in St. Louis and before the paper was even out, he had learned about cloning in yeast artificial chromosomes and yaks. And to me, the exciting part was to use, to work on yeast artificial chromosomes. Even though I never made it to the goal, and the goal was to clone human DNA in a, and he had generated as a trainee at, at Baylor, he had generated a, 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 a somatic cell hybrid, a human hamster cell line, where he had fused human cells from a patient with fragile X and hamster cells, and had fused them together, had irradiated them, and had uh, many times grown them, and could show that the fragile side of the fragile X was broken at the fragile site and fused to a hamster chromosome. So my easy task was to, in my time in his laboratory, to generate a yeast artificial chromosome that had part hamster DNA and part human DNA. And it was a thought that this yeast artificial chromosome would have the fragile site in it, as in would lead to the cloning of the fragile X gene. That wasn't meant to be. But in the process, I learned how to clone, I learned how to do long range mapping, I learned how to do use pulse field electrophoresis, uh, and learned how to make maps that actually were larger than just cloning a plasmid, uh, cloning a whatever 1 kb piece into a plasmid, but to have an 800 kb piece in the yeast artificial chromosome. So. But it, it all 
it, it, it's not very different from one another. That's it's true. it's all it's between patients, it's between chromosomes, and then having extended chromosomes, then mapping these chromosomes in somatic cell hybrids in Uta Franke's lab, then using at the time there was a method called southern blot analysis from very last millennium, and to to learn that and to be proficient at that to finding small pieces of DNA, let's say, to find a polymorphism, one that's 2.8 kb versus 3.4 kb, something that could be nice, nicely separated on a gel to on a larger gel where you could separate pieces from 10 kb to almost 1,000 kb in Bob Nussbaum's lab. It's just increasing the, the, the level of analysis by an order or two of magnitude. But it's not different. It's not out of a sudden doing space science. It's doing the same thing, just going into more detail and, and actually enjoying it tremendously. So doing chromosomes in, in my class that I gave the medical genetics class as a medical student, we would, I would draw blood on everyone. This would be completely ethically inappropriate nowadays at the time. We would, I would draw blood on every one of the medical students, and then we would analyze their karyotypes. And that was considered, that was considered standard of practice. It was even something wonderful in, uh, to do that in a medical genetics course, so that every medical, uh, that every medical student know his or her chromosomes. And fortunately, I've done this for four years. Never have I found anyone who had a different chromosome number than 46. I was very pleased with that. So, because I could have gotten into trouble way over my ears then. So. <laughs> Bob was one of the initial brand chiefs here. Francis Collins was uh, asked to lead the uh, extramural effort of the genome center at the time. He came here, and he came here with Jeff Trent uh, as his scientific director from the University of Michigan. And one of the first people they hired was Bob Nussbaum as a branch chief, and Jennifer Puck as a deputy branch chief, and a few other branch chiefs. Uh, David Ledbetter was a branch chief then. In the meantime, after I completed my Howard Hughes fellowship with Bob Nussbaum for three years, and sitting for my boards and genetics, I was offered a position at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia and, uh, uh, and the University of Pennsylvania on the faculty, which I accepted in July of 1980. And uh, 1990, sorry. And in 1990, I started my lab, in part still doing tissue culture in Bob Nussbaum's lab for many reasons. One was it was set up. Number two was it was for free. And fetal calf serum is very expensive. So Bob was not just a wonderful mentor, but he was also very generous. And then at some point, I forget whether it was year one or year two into my faculty position, he said, Max, I think it's time for you to start your own tissue culture lab, which I then, of course, did. So, so I started the research in my lab on two disorders that were both craniofacial disorders. One was a disorder, a craniosynostosis disorder, and th that was called Pfeiffer syndrome. And this is a disorder where the sutures of the skull are fused prematurely so that when the baby is born, where those sutures are always open so that it makes it easier, there can be an overlap of the sutures that the baby can make it more easily through the birth canal. Sometimes those sutures are fused at birth and the skull is misshapen at birth and at some point needs surgery to, to open up those sutures. So that was one project and then the other project was a project on the most common anomaly of the developing forebrain and that's called holoprosencephaly. And holoprosencephaly is in essence two words, prosencephalon is a forebrain and holoprosencephaly means instead of having two brain halves of the forebrain that there's just one single forebrain there. So that's holoprosencephaly. So, and so I've studied both of those disorders uh, at the University of Pennsylvania and the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. I was on clinical service, but I had protected time in the laboratory, which I was very grateful for. I was very grateful for NIH funding. I had a first award. I had an NIH R01 award. It was very exciting. And then I got tenure, and I thought life couldn't get any better. 
and that was pretty wonderful. And then I got a call first actually from uh, uh, David Ledbetter to join his branch as, a, as, an, uh, as an investigator. And it turned out that was at a time before I had tenure at Penn. And I felt if I leave before I have tenure, that looks like I was on the verge of not getting tenure. So that was not an option. And once I did have tenure, and I got tenure in 1996, I got another call. And I forget whether it was Bob Nussbaum or Claire Franco Mano, who was a branch chief of the medical genetics branch at the time. And then after some negotiations where things all happened very quickly, I joined one year after I had achieved tenure at the University of Pennsylvania, came here as, an, uh, as a senior investigator in 1997 into the medical genetics branch. And actually from day one, I became the director of the NIH medical genetics training program. I had been the director of the medical genetics training program at the University of Pennsylvania for the three years before. And, and I realized this is something that I really enjoy and people like that and wanted me to do this here as well. And I did that here and have been the director of that program for the last 19 years. So I, I think what it really does is I had extremely good mentors. Uta Franke, Bob Nussbaum, Elaine Zakai, and there are many others that I forget. And I, there are many others either with similar name recognition or less name recognition, but these were my direct supervisors, my direct mentors that had quite an imprint on me. And to see what their input on my career did, to me, that was something where I felt if and when I can do that, that is very important to me. I want to do the same thing. And to know that in the, since 1993, I have trained close to 200 physicians and PhDs in this training program and see people now be program directors, now be department chairs someone, somewhere else is very rewarding. And medical genetics is still a specialty where there are way too few people who are board certified, we need many more. So one way of getting more is to train more and to train more so that they train more. So, so it feels, feels very rewarding to be on committees where former trainees of mine are running the committee. It feels, it feels, very, it feels very good. I mean, first of all, he hired me, so that I'm very grateful for since I like this job. You can tell I've been here for, for 19 years. Uh, and then the other part is he was a very generous person and generous both financially and obviously that's easy at times when there's more money there, but also generous with regards to that he would just give broad parameters what he saw as a vision of the intramural program, but then really trusted the individual investigator, for example, me, that I would do the right thing. So I would come to him and tell him part of the reason to come to the NIH, I could have studied craniosynostrosis and holoprosencephaly just fine at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia uh, and the University of Pennsylvania with NIH funding, with Hughes funding, with other, other fundings. But I couldn't start a project that I felt I only could do at NIH. And that was a project on the genetics of attention deficit hyperactivity, which is the most common behavioral disorder of childhood. And now we know it's not just in childhood, it continues into adulthood. So if we find ways of finding causes that lead to either treatments or potentially cures eventually, to me, that seemed like a very worthwhile goal for a pediatrician like me, who is on one hand interested in birth defects. And so this is a little different in birth defects that are rare to something that's a behavioral trait and that's quite common and so that was something that I could not do at the University of Pennsylvania. So I had applied for grants and they were telling me you don't have enough preliminary data that we trust you you can do that and at NIH I could present this as part of my job interview this is what I want to work on and there were some preliminary data there either by my own group and or by others that Francis Collins and Jeff Trent, uh, Jeff Trent felt this is something that can be worked on. 
this is a worthwhile goal and we in the genome project can do this better than at other places. And that was actually the case. So I obviously I can't speak for the leadership. I can only speak for myself. And I, uh, to me, what I see, I see two major things that if I say cannot be done anywhere else, people would argue with me, but that are where the NIH is in a prime position to do this as part of an infomurally funded project. One is all of the benefits of the close collaboration with the NIH Clinical Center. To me, this is the crown jewel of the NIH, where we can see patients at the NIH Clinical Center and work with a blood sample. We can do all of the testing, and I could give you examples where this has changed the course of diagnostics and treatment of children with a specific disorder, where my group, and it's not about my group, every single other group who has patients at the NIH has done that and will do that in the future. That's one part. And that, if this is independent of healthcare insurance and availability of tests, but if this is something that can, this is something that can be done here better than at most places. The other part is for certain projects that are high risk, high yield, sometimes they take longer and they take longer than a funding cycle. I still remember my NIH grants were five years. Nowadays, you are lucky if you get three or four years. And four years is the absolute luxury, and you almost apply, you reapply once you're one year into your in one once you're one year into your grant. For me to talk about ADHD and the connection to a high-risk project, the high-risk project to work on ADHD, it was very clear to me the more defined the phenotype, the better the chance of finding underlying causes for any disorder but ADHD in particular, when this is a complex disorder. And so what was clear to me is I wanted to decrease the heterogeneity by working with a group of people where ADHD is more common than in the rest of the world and where this is a genetic isolate. And I inquired with different genetic isolates, and this was a wonderful learning experience in speaking to leaders in the field of the different isolates. And it turned out there's a genetic isolate. They call themselves the Paisas. They live in Antioquia, which is a district in Colombia, South America, uh, where of the small of the local capital Medellin. And the Paisas are a highly educated group of people. They came some 20 generations ago from the Basque part of Spain and have mostly very little admixture and have been marrying amongst and having families amongst one, one another. And so what Jeff Trent was able to do, he was able on top of the budget for my lab to pay the bill for five years in a row so that we could do the very detailed phenotyping work, the very detailed testing work that we needed to do in South America and then get blood samples from almost a thousand people from South America. And here we had large families where we had three generations where we had grandparents, sip ships of anywhere between eight and 16, where all of these people had children themselves and we could follow ADHD almost like we did in a plain autosomal, in a, in, a Mendelian, uh, in a Mendelian segregation. And so that was the way how we had the successes that we have had really courtesy of the long-term funding uh, from within the intramural program. So, yeah. so other people have done most beautiful studies on ADHD. And you can do many different studies. You can do my favorite studies are twin pair studies, where you have monozygotic twins. So these are twins who have, if not 100%, but close to 100% of the genetic material in common. So this would be just, uh, uh, in essence, like, like one person, except for there are two. And then there are, of course, dizygotic twins. And they are as closely related as siblings, except for they were in the womb together at the same time. So, so when you look at those studies, the numbers are very consistent. That is, if you study 100 monozygotic twins where one has ADHD, 
you would expect if it's 100% genetics, you would expect that every one of the other twins has ADHD as well. And the number is more like that if you have 100 twin pairs out of the other twins, anywhere between 70, 75, and 80 will have ADHD as well. So in genetics, I don't have to tell you this, the heritability factor would be somewhere around 70 to 75 percent. And that means that three quarters of the contribution to ADHD is genetics, whereas one quarter or maybe one fifth is, is environment. And to me, it's a very, so there, there are many times when you talk, ADHD is a very, a very uh, a likable topic at parties. And there are many people how come we have more ADHD now, it must be all our living conditions. And is it genetics in the first place? And those numbers are actually very helpful. They calm the discussion. They're just the facts. It's a little bit like one and one is two. It's very straightforward and it takes the emotions out of, out of discussions. Is it genes or environment? And the answer is yes. Of course, and and so it makes it it makes it much much easier. And then the question is, what are the environmental factors? And then the question is, what are the genetic factors? And I have my lab has less focused, actually not not much at all focused on the environmental factors, but really focused on the genetic factors. If the child is impaired, if the parents feel the child is impaired, if the teachers feel the child is impaired, if the classmates feel, just because I don't want to let this child be part of their group, this child is the outsider. So if there's impairment there, and then there are, it's not like you do a chromosome test where you identify a third chromosome 21, like in trisomy 21, but you do this by questionnaires. But in the end, the above all world word is impairment. And if there's impairment there, then what can we do to help this family? What can we do to help this child? And if there is no impairment there, then the parents have done a great job and the kid is doing a great job. And obviously, if you have a higher IQ, it gives you a little bit more range of coping mechanisms versus if your IQ is average or is lower. And of course, ADHD is not attached to any, AD, uh, to any IQ. And it comes among anyone of, of from low IQ to a very high IQ. So, yeah. so now we're switching from a complex common trait, ADHD, yeah. to a rare anatomical disorder, which is holoprosencephaly. Mm -hmm. So holoprosencephaly starts very early during gastrulation. And there are, again, environmental factors there and there are genetic factors there, but these factors have to work as early in humans at day 17 after conception, anywhere between day 17 and day 21, day 25, during the, after the first three weeks. So this is literally speaking just within a week after the last menstrual period is missing and the woman may not know or barely know that she is pregnant. That is when, when holoprosencephaly starts. And even though holoprosencephaly is rare at birth and even rarer as for one-year-olds and even rarer in adulthood, it's extremely common during early pregnancy. One in 250 embryos have holoprosencephaly. And that's certainly more common than most disorders that there are. And since Holoprosencephaly is such a severe disorder many times. Over 90% of affected embryos and fetuses are spontaneously aborted. So they end up in miscarriages. So these babies are not born alive, but they are miscarried beforehand. So. And so to answer your question, what can we learn by studying a very severe abnormality of the developing forebrain. In essence, we can study the normal development of the forebrain. And what we can study is, my lab had identified the first and probably still the most important gene in holoprosencephaly. If you have loss of function mutations in a gene called sonic hedgehog, then this leads to holoprosencephaly. Of course, the converse is true if you have a normally developed, a typically developing brain in humans, in mammals, in vertebrates, 
then sonic hedgehog is needed during early gastrulation. And so I think probably one of the main contributions of my lab is the link that we made between human holoprosencephaly and hedgehog signaling and other signaling pathways that are expressed early during development. And what's intriguing even after, so this is 2016, the very first patient with holoprosencephaly I saw in September of 1986. So this is the 30th anniversary, me seeing that first patient and knowing this is what I want to study. And it was very important for me to get a blood sample for this patient's diagnosis, but also a blood sample potentially for research after consigned, uh, 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 consent forms, signed consent forms, and so on. So what this work really has done is it has allowed us to put signaling pathways together. It has allowed us for even using regulatory regions, how they, regulatory regions on one gene, how they interact with another gene. For example, a regulatory region, if it's interrupted, by a translocation, just separated from the gene coding regions. What that, is, what that means is it's not, the gene isn't expressed because it's not started by a, by a regulator that can be very far away. We could show if this is not activating the gene, then the disease can be present. And so there's lots of basic science excitement. Of course, some of the work has not only been confirmed, but brought much further in animal model systems by other colleagues. And it's very pleasing to see how the work between humans and model systems, mouse, zebrafish, fruit fly, are all go hand in hand. Of course, it makes me smile to know that Christiane nusslein Vollhardt and uh, Professor Wieschaus, that they were the ones who identified the hedgehog gene in the fruit fly and were the Nobel laureates for that. So. Absolutely, yes, yeah. so that we can look at what, what we get as a benefit of ENCODE, what we get as a benefit of just comparing evolutionarily conserved sequences so that we know evolutionarily these sequences in the vicinity of, again, let me pick my favorite gene, sonic hedgehog, are evolutionarily conserved, not surprisingly, not just among all mammals, not just among all vertebrates, but going to fish, even to the fruit fly. And when these evolutionarily conserved sequences are conserved, there has to be a reason for it. And the reason is many times, not always, many times that this evolutionarily conserved, conserved region is a regulatory element for a gene in the closest proximity or very distantly away. And both are, are, are critical for, for expression of this gene. So. So there is, let me make a commercial for it. There's a website, www.genome.gov backslash atlas. And if you go there, then you find the project. And this is an atlas of human malformation syndromes in diverse populations. And it really, it started way back when. It started maybe in Germany and was carried along, but it really had a spark that it was clear we have to have a website at a trip to Nigeria. Since I mentioned already, I worked uh, in the department of Professor Wiedemann. There was an atlas of malformation syndromes that Professor Wiedemann was the sole author. And the photographer was actually not an author, but she was highly recognized in this book. Every single photo in this book was taken by her. And every single person was taken from a patient from the clinic and every single patient was of Northern European descent. And so that was my first experience. And I thought everyone with this syndrome with back with Wiedemann syndrome will look like this. Everyone with um, Down syndrome will look like this and so on. Turner syndrome. And then when I was in Philadelphia, it turned out, no, this is different. What really sparked something different was when two colleagues and I were in Nigeria to initiate a collaboration uh, with Dr. Ekanem Ekure at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital in Lagos, Nigeria. And she is an outstanding pediatric cardiologist, has a busy, busy clinic. And we were in her waiting area, just looking around. And the three of us, Paul Kuska, 
a family physician and, and medical geneticist in the medical genetics branch, Adiemo uh, Dibo uh, Adewale from the uh, Dr. Charles Rotimi's branch. And the three of us were, and he is a pediatrician medical geneticist. And we were in that clinic and just looking around, oh, this is it. And everyone in this child, what they had in common, uh, in this practice, what they had in common, they had a heart defect in common. And then we said, oh, this is a child with Down syndrome. We looked at one another and nodded. Oh, this is a child with Turner syndrome, nodded. This is a child with Noonan syndrome and nodded. And this is a child with Williams syndrome. And when we, and we all agreed on that, and when we then talked to Dr. Curry and told her, oh, she knew, of course, knew, yeah, they, oh, they had two children with Down syndrome, and then she was surprised, wait, which one does have Noonan syndrome? And which one has Turner syndrome? Which one has Williams syndrome? Which one has deletion 22Q11 syndrome? She was very surprised, and we were equally surprised, and just, I asked naively, has your geneticist, your medical geneticist, not seen those patients? And she just laughed and said, we don't have a medical geneticist in Nigeria. And so with that, it became very clear that even though their heart defects were very well characterized, and once we learned what the heart defects were, we were 100% sure of our diagnosis because these happen to be the most common heart defect in a child with truncus anomalies in a child with deletion 22Q11 syndrome, specific heart defects in Down syndrome, specific heart defect in Noonan syndrome. And so then it became clear that if the child has this fantastic diagnostic tool, uh, uh, ultrasound, cardiac ultrasound, EKG, and so on, and has a very well definition of, of, what the syn of what this child's heart looks like, but the physician and the parents do not know what the child's underlying diagnosis is. It's hard. The counseling is very hard. So it's very hard to answer questions when parents ask, what does this mean for my child? Does this have intellectual impairment does go with it? What's a surgery needed? What's a recurrence risk? If you don't know the di underlying diagnosis, it's hard to give a recurrence risk. And so then it became clear, we need an atlas that has children, not just of Northern European descent. And there are a number of famous atlases around. And there was a time when every single patient was of Northern European descent, the photos are in there. Nowadays, it's probably more like 90% of patients are of Northern European descent, maybe 10% are from diverse populations. And what, what the idea was between Paul Kruska, Dibo Adeyamo, and myself, we need an atlas that focuses specifically on children and adults who do not come from Northern European backgrounds, because there are many atlases around for or people from Northern European descent. So that's, that's when it started. So, and so now, it took a lot of community building, a lot of talking with leaders in the field, a lot of talking with Sarah Hull, our bioethicist and the chair of our IRB here, in, uh, of our Human Subjects Committee in, the, in our institute. And eventually, there are two papers out there that describe the process the pros and the cons. And um, after very careful weighing both sides, it was felt this is a useful contribution that, in essence, it will help with healthcare disparities so that not just individuals and people in developed countries who, who happen to be able to go to a tertiary medical care center where there are, is one or several medical geneticists, but that even in countries where there is no medical geneticist, that either the pediatrician, the cardiologist can look and compare facial features with an atlas of children from that same country. So I think what he has brought is he is one of the few physician scientists who have an equal foot in the lab and an equal foot in the clinic. There are very few of them around. There are many. Uh, I heard a statistics that in the Bethesda area, one in eight people have a PhD in all of Bethesda. That's the highest PhD rate anywhere in the world. At the NIH, I'm sure it's one in two people have a PhD, and probably one in five people have an MD-PhD. I'm exaggerating slightly. But many of the MD-PhDs 
even though they are physician scientists, they are not as active both as scientists and successful as a scientist as Dan Kastner and equally successful as uh, Dan Kastner as a physician. And I, I am well aware of higher numbers give you better data, but many times a case report, the n equal one, makes something that persuades you to do something. The n equal one for Dan Kastner is a colleague from a country from very far away from the US where this colleague happens to have a very specific disorder that Dan Kastner works on. When this person came as a patient to the NIH Clinical Center, I visited her just as a friend and a colleague, not as a physician, a number of times in the NIH Clinical Center. And she was telling me this was the first time that someone would take this much time with her. It was the first time that she got the largest workup ever, and it was the first time that a diagnosis was made where then treatment could help her. And she's back in her home country and is doing all the wonderful things that she does as a physician scientist in her home country. And so this N equal one experience is an experience where this friend of mine was telling me as a patient about Dr. Kastner, and I find that more convincing than a questionnaire of 100 patients who have been seen by Dr. Kastner. So that, that to me, goes a long way. I, I think over the last, probably over the last 10 years, there was a push not to neglect ever basic science, because really basic science drives translational science. At the same time, it has been my impression that with all of the work that the genome has allowed us to do, the, the uh, deciphering of the genome uh, that that has done, and the continuing work on the genome on understanding it, that that has led actually from diagnosis to really treatment. And I think the NIH Clinical Center is one of the premier institutions where you can do those things, where you can work not just what brings in money, but you can work for, on treatment and cures for rare disorders. And of course, my push would be there to give more funds to the NIH Clinical Center, that there's more support personnel there, that there's, that the, with shrinking or budget that stay the same, that the NIH Clinical Center definitely needs more budget. There's no doubt in my mind. It goes to expanding the services, the, the pediatric services. We can't have newborns here, obviously. You, uh, no one delivers their babies at the NIH, and that maybe is better left at, at outside hospitals. But it would be wonderful if we had all the services of a neonatal intensive care unit, a pediatric intensive care unit, where we could have children who are less than 10 kilograms and who are younger than X number of months there. So that would be an expansion which I would very much encourage the leadership of the NIH to do. So. Surprisingly, it's still holoprosencephaly. There were a number of times when I thought, do I stop it? And then I sat down very quietly, maybe took a, a silent retreat for a weekend, thought about things, and in the end came up with the thoughts of, at this point, we understand <coughs> half, I didn't mention this, half of the causes are known and they're chromosomal in origin. Then we knew a few other slivers that, that explain holoprosencephaly. But about two thirds of those non-chromosomal uh, causes, we don't know. And to me, over the last 30 years, we have learned so much and we have certainly more than scratched the surface. We have dug in deep, but there's way more to find out. There are two thirds more of the causes to find out. So it's something I feel very strongly about. And so doing, working more on this, and then very carefully consider based on recommendations of the Board of Scientific Counselors, of the review committee. We just had our quadrennial review and site visit, which has gone exceedingly well. But also, the, the site visitors' comments were not just insightful, they were constructive, was really rethinking and reshaping some of the future plans. And some of those, you cannot do this in a day or a week. 
Our site visit was literally speaking two weeks ago. So it's something to discuss in detail with other colleagues. Where can we get the most benefit? It's always about how do we benefit the patients? How can we get the most benefit for the patients over the next year? And whether that is in holoprosencephaly, whether that is in ADHD, cardiac anomalies, or uh, other disorders that we work on in the lab. So, so, so part of it is very clear. Others, it's very clear where to work on to get more clarity. And I'm grateful to the review committee who actually was instrumental in making some suggestions where to make some shifts and some adjustments. And I will not just consider those, but I will follow those and come up with a plan, not just for the next four years, but for the years after that. So,